Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out here on a cold um, Tuesday evening. So I, I'm Janet Cerrone. I'm a Sunset Park resident. I was born and raised here. Um, there's about two generations of my family living here, and we're very invested in staying here and staying put. So uh, I am one of the members of, of the Sunset Park Organized Neighbors Group, also known as SPAWN. We have here, um, well, well, SPAWN is just a group of, of regular neighbors of Sunset Park. Some of us are longtime residents um, who are very invested in our neighborhood. We live, work, or, and have children that go to school here, so we're very invested um, in how our neighborhood uh, develops and grows, right? So some of us are also members of the original coalition of Protect Sunset Park that fought against the Bloomberg, um, the Bloomberg time rezoning of 2009, and we're involved in the lawsuit there. Um, there's some news coverage on that if you want to uh, Google search it as well. Now, last year we learned about Industry City's rezoning plan. And we sought to bring the majority Latino and, China, um, and Asian residents of Sunset Park together and started organizing and putting together some petitions to um, started organizing to get people to sign petitions to um, basically say, no, we are not approving this proposed rezoning plan. We delivered um, these petitions that were about 4,000 to uh, our council member Carlos Menchaca in September. A few weeks later, um, some of you may have been at the town hall that he hosted. Now, here we are um, a few months later in 2020. Now, going to discuss IC's proposed rezoning plan. We're going to discuss uh, what the formal process is, which is called ULERP, but it's uh, known as a Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. And then we're going to um, give the mic over to the, um, some expert urban planners and organizers that have um, successfully um, or are still organizing their neighborhoods um, in places outside of Brooklyn and in Inwood and the Lower East Side to talk about the rezoning um, fight that they're putting on there. So, okay, so moving on to the, what is IC's proposed rezoning plan? So if you look at 3rd Avenue, um, between 32nd and 39th streets, there's these very big warehouse buildings, right? This is kind of an aerial view of what uh, Industry City looks like. Now, right now, um, in, well, in 2013, so when I was in, in college, I was learning a little bit about Industry City's rezoning plan. And I learned, you know, Jamestown Properties was one of the, is one of the co-owners of, uh, of the building, as well as Belvedere and Gordon and Co. So these are big real estate developers that, um, have a lot of money and have bought up Industry City. Industry City is made up of about 16 buildings, sits on 3rd Avenue, and there's about 5.3 million square feet. To put that into context, that's a little bit more than the World Trade Center um, square feet and what it occupies now. Uh, Industry City has a zoning that's uh, called the M3 zoning. What that means is that it's a heavy manufacturing zoning. Um, so right now, there's a little bit of flexibility of what can, um, how an M3 zoning can be used. And so if you ever frequent the space, there are stores like World Market, there's restaurants and coffee shops. Some of the you know, stores may not be affordable to an ordinary Sunset Park resident. Now, I see proposed that they want to change that M3 zoning to M2 zoning. So we use that lingo a lot, the urban planners use maybe use that lingo a lot, but what it means is they want, um, to, in a way, to change the zoning so that it allows for a little bit more flexibility in how they can use the space. They proposed also a special district kind of zoning. So that would, what that would mean is the city cannot limit how they use the space. Um, they proposed a hotel in the space. They proposed uh, also demapping. That means removing 40th Street from the New York City public map. And people are like, yeah, well, we don't walk down 40th Street. Well, what that means is they can use 40th Street um, however they wish. So there's not gonna be limitations on how they use that space. We think that this is only, this is um, probably only the first wave of proposed rezonings in Sunset Park. So it looks like there's definitely gonna be more uh, anticipated rezoning and they've, and they've said in the past that they propose to acquire more property um, in the next four years. So 
We're in this process now called the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. This is a standard procedure where um, applic applications that are affecting the way that our land in New York City is used must go through. It will often be called the ULERP process. Now, what is the ULERP process? What does that mean? That's kind of where we're sitting at right now. Um, so, we know that there have been some modifications to um, the space in New York City. We have seen the expansion of the NYU Lungone Centers. We've seen in Wood rezoning, um, a couple of rezonings in other neighborhoods. Now, Industry City sits with a couple of other um, projects and proposed rezonings that are still in review. And so right now, and so this is just a timeline of what the Euler process is. So first, um, we're kind of, right now we're sitting between the borough president and the city planning commission space, that kind of longer one in the middle. Now, to give you an overview first, we have the Department of City Planning. So this is a, a, a city department that is composed of a couple of people that were um, um, elect, not elected, nominated by the borough president and some city council members and mayor. So they create the application and start the process. The application moves on to the community board. Um, we're sitting in the space of the community board now. And so the community board chooses, um, the community board members are um, supposed to um, reflect the neighborhood sentiments. May that might not always be the case now. Um, and the community board members are elected by the borough president, which uh, Brooklyn residents elect into office. Now, the community board reviews this application, right? So they're reviewing the industry city proposed plan and they vote on whether or not the application should be fo move forward. But their vote's not non-binding, it's more like an advisory vote. Um, after, the, after the community board votes, in theory, the borough president goes in to vote and recommends whether or not the plan should move forward. That's also an advisory board, I mean, sorry, an, an advisory vote. Then, we're sitting at the time with, with um, whether or not the City Planning Commission votes on the proposal. And then we keep moving forward. The City Council, um, the City Council as a whole has to vote whether or not the Euler process moves forward. And there's this un unofficial home rule where um, our, uh, you know, our, our council member is Carlos Menchaca, so depending on how he votes, that is, um, it basically sways the other votes on to vote in that direction. But the, just to keep in mind, um, other council members will vote in line with the um, council member from the district. Um, and that vote cannot veto the plan. So there might be some misconceptions about whether or not Carlos Menchaca can say no to the plan. Um, he can propose no, but it can't, he can't veto it. And in theory, after it moves on, after the application moves on from being reviewed by the city council and after the city council votes, it sits um, with mayor and the mayor de Blasio. So we know the mayor's number one priority is to have a fiscally healthy city. They want to bring money to the city. We know real estate's a very, very large part of the city's um, tax base, right? So we know that also the mayor, he can choose whether or not to veto the plan. Now, if the mayor thinks that the plan's not gonna move forward, he'll sometimes act the city before the city council votes to withdraw the application. So he'll ask the city, um, the city planning commission to withdraw the application. Um, in September, uh, council, you know, member Menchaca hosted an event, a town hall with a couple of Sunset Park residents and talked about um, industry city our way. That was kind of how he pushed the, the, the idea to us. And so something that we realized was he was kind of offering a community benefits agreement known as a CBA as um, the plan for approving Industry City's proposed rezoning. And so in the uh, community uh, benefits agreement is an agreement that's signed between um, developers, you know, politicians that represent the, the residents and the residents and often not, uh, nonprofits from the neighborhood. It, it's an agreement where everyone kind of is in line with how the proposed rezoning should go forward, right? Um, so in exchange for support on the plan, we, there's some concessions. Um, we know community benefits agreements are not legally binding and some of and our experts are gonna go more in depth about what these are, right? 
but an example of some CBAs around the city are Atlantic Yards, Yankee Stadium, if you ride up the D train from 36th Street all the way up there, and also Chelsea Market. And so, moving forward, why are we here today? Um, we want to hear from the expert planners in the New York City arena and how um, other residents and other neighborhoods have mobilized and fought against proposed rezonings in their neighborhood. We um, are probably going to ask some tough questions about how city government and elected officials like Mayor de Blasio and our council member Manchaca, um, whether or not they're neutral or whether or not they're influenced by developers in our city and how that is actually the root of the problem with why we feel like we're not being heard about our automatic 100% no to this proposed zoning plan. Um, I think some of these experts are going to offer you know, their advice and some life lessons that they've learned in this fight. And we should definitely think about how we can apply these lessons to Sunset Park. So first I'd like to introduce um, Tom Angori sitting closest to me right now. He's a professor of emeritus of urban policy and planning at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, CUNY um, City University of New York. He was the founder and director of the Hunter College Center for Community Planning and Development. His recent books include, um, there's a list, but I'll, uh, there's a, a pretty significant amount of publications, which is pretty neat. Um, so there's Transformative Planning, Radical Alternatives to Neoliberal Urbanism, Zoned Out, Race Displacement in City Planning in New York City, Urban Latin America, Inequalities and Neoliberal Reforms, The New Century of the Metropolis, New York for Sale, Community um, Planning Confronts Global Real Estate, and he's an editor of ProgressiveCity.net and is active in community and environmental issues in New York City. He was born, um, he was born in Brooklyn, lives in Windsor Terrace nearby, and was a senior planner at the Brooklyn Office of City Planning for six years. Um, I'd also like to introduce Sylvia Morse, who is a lifelong New Yorker, um, is an urban planner and one of the editors of Zoned Out, Race Displacement and City Planning in New York City. And I'd also, sitting next to Sylvia is Lena Melendez. Um, she's a social worker by training and is a lifelong resident of Washington Heights in Manhattan. Uh, and also is also a member of the um, Inwood Legal Action. So she can talk a little bit more about the Inwood rezoning plan. And then sitting next to Lena is Zishan Ning uh, from the Coalition to Protect Chinatown and the Lower East Side and member of Youth Against Displacement. I think we can, we can move on to um, hear from Tom, Sylvia, Lena, and Zishan about you know, what their experiences have been in organizing and um, what their experiences have been with the Euler process. I, um, I'm, I'm excited to hear what details they can share and see how any of them can be proposed solutions for us in organizing in the future against um, industry cities rezoning. Thank you. Um, it's a good way to start because I think that there's a real sentiment there um, from years of people feeling like they're not being heard and also constantly going through these exhausting processes and then don't see as anything as a result. So um, I think there's truth in what just happened. Um, but so Tom and I uh, are going to talk about um, some of the lessons that we've learned and, and tried to address in Zoned Out where we were looking at um, how the city approaches planning and particularly zoning as its primary approach to planning and the impact on um, race and displacement. Um, and I do just want to say thank you to all of you for, for having us here um, to join in this conversation and learn from others. And thank you to our interpreter. Um, if I go too quickly, just remind me to slow down. Um, so we're here talking about the industry city um, application that's going through the ULERT process, right, or this public review of a land use decision. Um, and we got a little bit of this intro, but why do we keep ending up in these situations where we're talking, where we're going through ULERT? What is that? Not every single thing that we build or every decision the city makes has to go through ULERT or environmental review. The idea is that if there's sort of an extraordinary decision that and when, if there's a change in zoning, that certain things are going to go through this public review process. Um, ideally, we would have a plan for the city that we could judge some of these proposals against. 
but instead of having an approach to citywide comprehensive planning developed through community-based planning process, we have these kind of one-off zoning changes that might be initiated by the Department of City Planning for neighborhood rezoning, oftentimes in coordination with developers and groups that represent them, or where a private landowner and developer is asking for a special change for, to zoning for something they want to do. And what's important here is that ULERP, as much as it gets talked about as a process where the community can be heard or a community kind of planning process, it's not that. It's a place where the city has received or worked on a complete proposal, and there's a law that says they have to disclose to the public that they're planning to do it. They have to hear public comment, and in some cases, in, when we're talking about environmental review, kind of acknowledge that they've considered those things. That's it. The plans have already been in development for years, sometimes involving certain representatives of the community, sometimes not. Um, so it's important to kind of acknowledge that where we're coming from is the community sort of being put on the defensive at the end of a planning process to weigh in, and then often gets accused of being kind of obstructionist and just not wanting change um, because they've only been invited in at the end of the process and are seeing something that they were never involved in, right? And being asked to make comment, and then when they do make comment, being told, why, why don't you want good things? Um, and so, we're, in these conversations, we're mostly talking about zoning. And all zoning does is basically say, what can go where, right? Is it a park? Can nothing be built there? Is it, a, is it um, for residential use? Can people live there? Can people work there? Um, can you make heavy, noisy, kind of smelly, dangerous things like manufacturing? That's what zoning says. And then how big can it be? Um, so that's a pretty blunt tool that's only one part of city planning um, and it's not very good for addressing our entire history of uh, racial oppression and inequality in this country particularly because we're talking about how we regulate land and in this country we it's built on stolen land and the white wealthy class has built all of their power and wealth primarily through land and by policing it through actual police forces and police powers like zoning to keep it in the hands of the people who stole it and have continued to acquire it over the years, right? So um, zoning is not going to help address like inherited poverty and ongoing racism and all of these things. That said, it has historically been built up around those things. Um, like I described, and even like the, the zoning resolution that we have in place today, the beginning of zoning was really had to do with property developers wanting to protect their property rights and kind of put the noxious uses over there and other uses over there. And we talk about in zoned out histories of, you know, throughout the U.S. where people actually wrote racial exclusions, sometimes explicit, sometimes less so, um, to keep certain neighborhoods uh, white in most cases. Um, so in New York, zoning is not going to be a great way to prevent um, displacement um, or address deeper inequalities, but it can be used by developers to protect their property rights and whether that means allowing them to build bigger in the residential neighborhood or taking something like a manufacturing zone and allowing commercial or residential uses. Those are ways that property values will try to use, property owners will try to use zoning to increase their property values. And part of why, I think important context, part of why we talk about zoning so much instead of other tools for planning, like the budget, right, to support like housing that people can afford to live in, um, is because we've been living in you know decades and decades of the federal government cutting back money for things like public housing, um, for education, um, state government doing this as well. And zoning is something that's under local control um, and where we can have some influence um, with the private sector and where politicians can say, hey, we built X number of affordable units um, through this zoning plan. Um, and I'm mindful of time, um, but I'll just say that amidst all of this um, and the ongoing zoning fights that we've seen kind of under the Bloomberg area, era and, and continued with similar proposals under de Blasio, 
Um, we're also seeing, I think, some promising movements forward. So there were, was a big win at the state level in June on increasing tenant protections, which is another really important planning tool um, that can do much more to fight displacement um, than particular zoning plans. Um, and then, of course, we're also now seeing the real estate industry push back about that a bit. So we can go further into that later, but just wanted to kind of give that context. Okay, thanks, Sylvia. That's that was a pretty streamlined explanation, so if there are questions later on, I would be glad to take them. I'm going to give the context and talk about Sunset Park Industry City, um, despite the fact that I was told I don't know anything about it. Um, I, when I worked for the City Planning Department, I was the planner assigned to Community Board 7, Sunset Park, so I've been here many times and uh, talked with the community board many times. Um, there's a long history of struggles over the waterfront. The waterfront was first developed in the latter part of the 19th century, early 20th century, and um, for many years it was a vibrant uh, uh, shipping center, industrial center, and so forth, and then in the post-Second World War II period, uh, private developers be became interested in it, and there was a whole period of disinvestment in industry. Uh, so many uh, citizens of Sunset Park and other neighborhoods were lobbying the government to protect industry and preserve the waterfront as an industrial waterfront. Um, but the zoning policy for the city was that industry was passe. It's gone. It's moving out. It's moving to the south. It's moving um, to other countries in the world. And so uh, we better look at converting industrial sites to other uses. Well, there's one big problem with Sunset Park Waterfront. It was heavily contaminated from years of heavy industrial, unregulated use. And so um, there was a plan to redevelop the industrial part of it and bring new industries in, but the city was not all that interested in this. They, in fact, there were fights within city government, which I was happy to be part of, uh, saying, no, don't give up, we can still have industry, it depends on our local policy, our zoning policies. Uh, but that, um, that was a, a fierce fight, and um, and by and large, the non-industrial advocates won. Uh, and the whole Brooklyn Queens waterfront that used to be industrial has turned into one after another series of high-rise towers of luxury housing. And that was the result of city zoning and planning policy, or lack of planning. Um, but Sunset Park sort of, and Red Hook, by the way, but Sunset Park sort of remained outside the loop for many years because of its heavy contamination and because the city was looking for other places, uh, for places to put certain noxious uses that nobody else wanted. So they said, we're gonna build new sludge treatment plants in the city. Uh, sludge is the waste that comes from the sewage system after it's treated. It all comes together and then the sludge it, it, it looks exactly what it sounds like, it's sludge, uh, uh, gets treated and uh, dried and, and then sold somewhere. Well, people in Sunset Park fought back, and they won. The mayor dropped the plan, and, and then he said, okay, we'll build it in Red Hook. And then the people of Red Hook fought back, and they won. So the city does not have a single sludge treatment plant and continues to export it to other places in the country, which is not a good outcome either, but it just shows what you can do with organizing. Um, then there was uh, waste transfer stations. Uh, Sunset Park, Red Hook were the targets for privately owned waste transfer stations. And uh, uh, we won that battle. Okay. Uh, then there were a couple of other modestly positive things. Costco uh, came and moved on the waterfront, which is better than 
uh, you know, having um, high-end luxury uh, uh, stores. Um, and the, the climate justice movement kicked in. Uprose is a protagonist in that, uh, Uprose here in Sunset Park, and an active leader in the environmental justice movement around the city. And basically the whole point there is that the waterfront uh, should not be used as a tool of gentrification and displacement. When you bring in high-end commercial uh, uses and uh, residential and you put them in there, you jack up land values and rents that force out people that are not on the waterfront, that are in uh, Sunset Park itself. So, um, up rose one, uh, a couple of battles, and one of the most important one was the park on the waterfront, which was uh, um, decontaminated, and a, a park with public access. There, that whole area was not accessible to the public, and now it is. So, um, I just want to end with what I see as the problems with the industry city plan. It is, uh, it is providing as a substitute for all of these noxious uses, an even more noxious use, which is luxury retail, high-end retail, and services that are not meant to serve the working people of this city, of this neighborhood, and of the city. And uh, my final problem is an even bigger one. The whole Brooklyn Queens waterfront is in danger of being submerged in the next um, 30 to 40 years because of sea level rise. The scientists are predicting up to nine feet of sea level rise. And the city continues this absurd policy of building high rise housing on the waterfront and the real estate people love it. Why? Because they recover their investments in 20 years, 25 years. And then, if we're all living underwater, it doesn't matter to them, they made their money. And the city is closing its eyes to the reality that the whole Brooklyn Queens want. They want to build a, a trolley line, the BQX, uh, to go up and down the waterfront. It's gonna be underwater in five years, or 10 years. You raise it up, and nobody will use it. So. Um, um, I, I think uh, uh, the fight here in Sunset Park is very important. Yes, that means both of us. <laughs> okay, uh, because we are beginning to see the beginning of the end of these <coughs> zoning sellouts because people are opposing them, and we're going to hear about uh, the inward rezoning, but. Uh, every single one of Mayor de Blasio's rezonings has been hotly contested, even when they won. And we were going to uh, wrap up our initial section just by talking about some other, you know, strategies for both kind of the fight on this particular industry city fight and kind of looking broadly about um, some of the bigger challenges uh, in Sunset Park and citywide, but we are over time, and I'm sure we'll have time in the Q&A to come back to it, so we'll, we'll do that then. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lena Melendez, and um, I'm a renter. Um, one of the things that come to mind with this uh, with the inward rezoning fight was is you know that quote from Margaret Mead never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world indeed it's the only thing that ever has that's something that it was certainly true for the inward fight um, we've had a small group of people that got together and around the issue of resisting the inward rezoning. Uh, and it was called Northern Manhattan is not for sale. That was, that was its purpose. 
Um, and if I had to say, if I had to choose the single most important thing that got us to where we are now, that that to got that got us to that point where we the the inward rezoning was annulled, uh, I would have to say that it was the organizing. Um, it was no, you know, three four years worth of people, scores of meetings with you know, telling the people, do forums like this, telling people uh, about what a rezoning could mean for their community. Um, um, getting members from the community involved, like the business owners, uh, clergy, the church members, um, union members, tenant associations, tenant uh, non-for-profit, uh, that were focused on housing. Um, full, we had a full-time paid organizer as well. So that's something that contributed to the success of the organizing. Um, I, um, among the dozen plaintiffs, these were, you know, a lot of let me, let me back that up. Northern Manhattan is not for sale was one of the plaintiffs that was named in the Inwood rezoning, uh, the, the lawsuit, the Inwood legal action lawsuit. Uh, it was an article, we used the Article 78 lawsuit, which um, is when you take a city agency, to task um, because of some some action that they took uh, that was capricious or arbitrary and that did harm. Sorry, do you want to tell people what the Inwood rezoning, what they were proposing? Ah, the Inwood, the Inwood rezoning, they were proposing, oh my goodness, they were going to take the commercial U and uh, do like a, sh I believe like a shopping mall. They were they were knock they were they were going to be knocking out of the small businesses that we had there that were affordable to the people in the community that were culturally relevant to the people in the community, which is a mostly immigrant population and children of immigrants. Um, and they were going to take 10th Avenue. All the auto industry uh, businesses were going to be um, moved uh, because, as the EDC put it, they were not of economic value to the city. Uh, they were of economic value to the community, but it wasn't of economic value to the city. Um, they wanted to upzone from the the buildings from six to eight from six eight story buildings to fifteen story buildings. But when we looked, once the rezoning was passed, they uh, we realized that they they didn't plan for fifteen. The plan was for thirty. So when you take and the mandatory inclusionary housing uh, program that the mayor is espousing as providing us with affordable housing uh, and was initially supposed to be to integrate people of color into rich white neighborhoods in another state, when you take that and use that to integrate uh, rich white people into a community of color, it has the opposite effect. It has the effect of displacement. Um, Why is that? Because of the, because you're taking, you're asking a developer to make 80% uh, uh, market rate apartment units and only taking building 20% of so-called affordable housing, which isn't affordable to anybody in the community, and now the buildings that are not being up-zoned 
that are not going to be 30 stories, those landlords are, you know, they're selling their properties to the to speculators that are just buying up. There were there was 600 and over 610 million dollars invested in speculative uh, purchasing of buildings in Inwood as soon as the word rezoning was uttered. So uh, rents went up, evictions went up. 80% of the evictions that were happening in the housing courts in Manhattan were from Inwood and Washington Heights. That's what happens when you mention rezoning in an area that's low income. But I just wanted to, I'm getting off topic, and I wanted to, I don't, I have but 10 minutes. So, um, if you have any more questions, I ask you to leave it for the end. Um, the, the, one of the things that I think built power uh, was the fact that we, uh, we knocked out the IDC, the, the, uh, the Independent Democratic Caucus that were Democrats really voting like Republicans. That built a sense of power among the people in the community. So we pointed to that and said, look what we could do when we get together. And that gave us a sense of a collective power. Um, you know, uh, there was uh, we engaged the media also because see the city didn't really do a very good job of announcing this to the community, which is why we had folks. Um, we gave these kind of forums to people in the community because nobody knew what a rezoning was. Nobody, you know, they didn't understand what was, what had happened in Williamsburg, could happen in Inwood. Um, so, to go straight into the lawsuit, the lawsuit that was argued, you know, the community asked for uh, studies. Uh, the ULIP process is, is a process so that the city can engage the community and get feedback from the community when they're planning this rezoning. Uh, but they totally ignored everything that we asked for. Uh, we asked them to examine the difference between the city's predictions in past rezonings and actual the actual results, like what happened in Williamsburg. And they declined. They said they didn't have to do it. It wasn't in their seeker manual. They, we asked them to study residential displacement. Uh, we asked them to study women and minority-owned businesses. They declined. Traffic congestion on emergency response times. They refused. Speculative real estate activity. They didn't do it. Uh, cumulative impact of the rezoning with other major land use actions. They didn't do that. Closing Inwood Library for three to five years, what the impact of uh, that would be. Um, the, a full use library to like an interim, smaller, lesser library. Uh, and we asked them to study what the impact of preferential rents on displacement would be. And they refused to do that. So the Article 78 argued that if in fact this is, a, you know, the regular processes for the community to be engaged and give feedback and these things were not studied, and we asked for them, and they were, we were refused, then what did we do the, the uh, EULA process? What, what was done in the EULA process? The EULA process was a sham, and <coughs> we knew that, uh, now the judge saw that, and the, her courtroom was filled with people from the community, and she saw it that, you know, that there was a community involvement, that there was um, something wrong with it. She took a look at it and she gave, a, she gave it to us on all eight counts. And that's how the annulment, ha that's what happened in the annulment. Uh, she realized that the community had not been engaged, even though they said, the city said that there was, you know, that there was 
uh, community involvement and went through the ULIP process. Uh, so I think I'm out of time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we save it for the end. And I think it's, we'll give it to Tishan. Thank you, Lina, um, Sylvia, and Tom. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the example uh, of fights in the, um, uh, Chinatown and the Lower East Side, um, which you know, which we have been organizing for years, um, and uh, and also I've you know seen the you know the very inspiring struggle in Sunset Park uh, against the uh, industry city rezoning. Uh, and uh, and I also you know you, you're probably a better you know people to, to, to tell me right because you're more knowledgeable um, on this. Uh, but I've been participated you know in, in town hall meetings where Manchaka you know trying to say oh you know yeah the industry city rezoning is you know probably you don't you don't like it but you know it's better than nothing right you know if you do industry city my way then it's at least you know you can you can get something out of it. Uh, you know, because you say, okay, if, if you're against this rezoning, then, then what do you want, right? So, you know, it's important, yes, we, we, we are fighting against the developer's plan, but, you know, um, at the same time, we need to, you know, have something, you know, um, affirmative to put out, you know, what, you know, what do we want exactly, what do we want to see the community, uh, you know, will be, right? I think that was the example uh, the, the community of Chinatown and Louis Sai uh, uh, was facing uh, back in the 2008. Um, so, like uh, Tom, you know, Sylvia has, uh, you know, pointed out that, uh, you know, the city already has a plan, you know, before they engage the community, right? Because uh, they, they are not a neutral party. They, they, they represent the interests uh, of uh, the rich developers. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, they, they want to pass rezoning plans that uh, really help developers, really help the rich developers against the community. And uh, when the community try to put, put up something, then they will say, oh, you know, we can't do anything about it, you know. And like Manchaka say, oh, if you want to put out your, your, your own plan, you know, you might have to wait for 10 years. Um, and uh, of course, you know, because they're not in our, in our interest, then, you know, then that, that's the excuse. Um, in 2008, the, the city uh, uh, in our neighborhood, um, Low East Side, Chinatown, and the East Village, uh, which are all part of the Community Board 3, um, they uh, tried to pass the uh, protective rezoning uh, of East Village, uh, at that time already mostly um, uh, white middle class, um, to, uh, to protect the neighborhood from, from uh, luxury high rises. Uh, what does that what does mean is that uh, they will uh, put a high limit uh, on any new development uh, so that you know as a way to discourage uh, these uh, luxury developments and uh, speculators from coming in um, at that time the Chinatown and the Lowy side came out uh, protested against this plan uh, saying that you know it's uh, racist it's a uh, you know because uh, you protect the white middle class but not not us uh, as a result, uh, the, the development will, will come down to Chinatown and the Lower East Side. And uh, the Bloomberg administration at that time, because of the pressure, he said, okay, then you guys uh, should come up, come up with your own plan. Uh, so he agreed to, uh, to uh, the community to form uh, uh, what uh, later became the Chinatown Working Group to come out with our own rezoning plan. So uh, to to just to say you know uh, uh, you know to to to, to uh, again uh, uh, Tom as we highlighted earlier that uh, you know zoning is a tool right so um, you know when when the community you know uh, the community can also use the zoning uh, to to uh, you know give protection uh, behind it is the you know the a way for for us to really assert you know what we want uh, as a community and uh, so. Uh, oh yeah, before that, yes. So uh, after 2008, uh, we have seen a lot of changes uh, in Chinatown and the Lower East Side uh, as a result you know, of uh, no protection. Uh, because uh, when the luxury development comes in, it will uh, drive up the rent and the real estate taxes uh, of the surrounding area. So as a result, the whole area becomes more expensive and more and more unaffordable. Uh, the tenants are, are, are facing eviction, right? Because the landlord wants to raise rent, and uh, you know, the, for the majority of the family there, they cannot afford, you know, this kind of drastic uh, rent increase. And for small business as well, you know, they, they cannot afford the rent, so uh, they are facing uh, displacement as well. And as a result, also the, the workers who work in the businesses, uh, they're going to lose their jobs. 
So that's uh, what we have been uh, seeing in the Chinatown and the Lower East Side for, uh, for years. And uh, like the, the example, right, very concretely, uh, oh, I haven't finished it. So um, we have seen the privatization of uh, public housing. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, luxury towers, uh, 80, uh, 60 to 80 stories being proposed on the waterfront. And uh, we have seen tenant evictions. Uh, uh, as an example, is the 85 Bowery, uh, which I can mention a little bit uh, 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 later on. And we even see, we even see the, the, the jail being proposed in Chinatown, uh, 50 story. Um, all these, you know, because of uh, no, uh, no, no high limits, you know, of the neighborhood. So the Chinatown Working Group plan, the rezoning plan, uh, is to is actually the the, the 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 goal of it is to fight for equal protection, you know, as the as the East Village, uh, and uh, and the group came up with the plan in two thousand fifteen, and at that time it was uh, the Blasio uh, administration, so you know who you know claimed to be a uh, progressive, uh, but um, he said that our plan is too ambitious, you know we say we we just want want the equal protection, you know. Um, and uh, what the Blasio is doing is uh, continue the, the city's uh, racist legacy. Um, so the, the plan also, uh, apart from you know, uh, putting high limits on the whole area of the Chinatown and the Lower East Side, is to uh, require any new development on public land to be 100% affordable to the community. So it's not the, the phony, you know, so-called affordable housing, but really look at the, the income level of the community. And uh, because without the plan, you know, you see the privatization of uh, NYCHA. Uh, happening. So, the but but then through the organizing, uh, we're able to uh, unify the whole community. You know, whether you live in Chinatown or Lower East Side, whether you you know live here, work here, do small business here, uh, you know, whether you're low-income family or, or you you know you, you're young, you know, professional moving in, uh, uh, looking for you know cheaper housing because you know this is the city is more and more unaffordable uh, for us to live, and. Um, the example of 85 Bowery is, is good because uh, they, they have been, you know, not only fighting against the, the landlord's eviction, but uh, also, you know, being part of the Chinatown Working Group to, uh, to push for the, the protection. So uh, when in 2018, oh, that's already two years ago, uh, when they got uh, uh, pushed out uh, into the code, uh, they're able to, uh, you know, galvanize the whole community support because the community has, has seen them, you know, in the forefront. Uh, to, to fight for the protection of the whole community. So they, they become the, the, the unifying force. Um, and in the end, that was uh, uh, how they were able to uh, go back home because of the whole, uh, because of the great pressure uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the unity from the community and beyond uh, to uh, force uh, Mayor de Blasio, you know, to, to, you know, uh, and the landlord to uh, let them go home. So in the end, they were, you know, not only able to go back home uh, after seven months of being displaced, uh, but also get a very good uh, uh, agreement from the landlord, uh, you know, guaranteeing them the, the rent stabilization uh, and also fix the apartment and, and all of that. So this is a very good example of why, you know, um, you know, single cases uh, can, can go beyond it and uh, actually, you know, lead the fights uh, to protect the whole community. Uh, but uh, also besides this, uh, like I said uh, earlier, you know, there's uh, been a proposal uh, for uh, luxury towers. And uh, this is our current fight. Uh, so we just uh, had a petition uh, asking Mayor de Blasio and the City Council uh, Speaker Corey Johnson uh, to stop these towers and also to pass the whole Chinatown Working Group plan. So um, uh, just uh, two weeks ago or a week ago, uh, we delivered the petition of 5,000 signatures uh, to, uh, to, to the city, uh, you know, demanding them, de demanding them to stop the towers and, and uh, pass the plan. So uh, what can we learn from this, right? Um, you know, we, we need to unite a unite community and overcome the differences, right? Because uh, we are a very diverse neighborhood and um, I believe in Sunset Park as well. Uh, you know, uh, income, race, you know, geography, generations, language, and uh, community-led rezoning uh, is a way uh, to do it, you know, like in the Chinatown and the Lower East Side because, you know, it covers the whole area, so it's in the interest you know, whether you're Chinese, Latinos, whether you live in the Two Bridges or Chinatown, you know, we have the same interests, right? And the second point is to see the common targets, right? We realize that this, the, the city is representing the, the interests of the community. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're not only fighting against, you know, uh, uh, one, you know, single rich developer, but their representatives. Uh, and that's a very effective way uh, to, to, uh, to address the, the, the root cause of the problem.
and to unify the community. So uh, I'll stop here uh, because I think time is up and uh, I'll leave you for questions. Thank you very much for your overview um, about some of the work that you've all done. We certainly appreciate learning and I've taken very vigorous notes. Now, uh, I, I'd like to open up the floor for um, and invite people to um, pitch in and ask questions and feel comfortable and you know engage and have an open conversation. Um, with that in mind, given um, I would make, encourage everyone to follow some grand rules to not speak over one another, to step up, step back. We know there's definitely other people who have been very involved in this organizing effort. And I'm not standing here as an expert on the rezoning plan, but I'm just standing here as a Sunset Park resident who wants to hear um, everyone's opinions, but will also not um, stand for any disrespect um, um, against any other you know, uh, member who's here. Now, I'd like to open up with a question that um, we can all maybe pitch in and see what we think. Do you uh, agree with our council member's sentiment that if we don't approve Industry City's proposed rezoning, then um, Industry City will continue building. And if we don't approve this, it's better to have um, this plan with conditions as opposed to no plan. What do people think? Maybe by a show of hand. How many people think that um, they, they agree with the sentiment that our council member has shared in the past? What, what, did you, what did you say? It's better to have a plan than no plan. Yeah, it's better to have a plan. Um, so Councilmember Menchaca in September um, proposed, right, proposed saying yes with conditions, right? How many people here think, uh, how many people here agree with that? Let, let's, Industry City, move forward with conditions. Um, all right. You're not going to stop them. How many people want to stop them? How many people want to stop them and don't agree with that plan? And how many of us in this room are willing to pitch in some time, you know, to figure out and convene it in some of our Sunset Park spaces to really think about how to stop them? Yeah. All of you who raise your hand, I really encourage you to come meet with um, some of the organizers that have put together this event to really brainstorm and think how we can move forward from this. Does anyone here maybe have any questions they'd like to pose? to each other or to some of our presenters here today? Yeah. I have a question about um, just like urban planning and zoning regulations. Um, what's the likelihood of instead of um, pulling back on the restrictions, enforcing stronger manufacturing restrictions or what are the chances of um, modifying the city's current zoning regulations so that um, there's not as much wiggle room even with an M3 zoning. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, so again, the New York City has a zoning resolution which lays out basically the types of zoning it allows and all the zoning in different parts of the city, but that's not the same thing as a comprehensive plan where there's a sense for like, how are we gonna grow in the future? What do we need? And as a city, where should it go? Which is why, again, we tend to see these neighborhood rezonings or um, a specific kind of, we don't call them spot rezonings, but like these zonings where the developer is requesting something. And again, with you, are, we're reviewing a proposal that Industry City has put together. So I don't personally think that the negotiations through ULERP are typically the best place to try to push back in that way. Because again, the proposal that has been certified with city planning and is being reviewed comes from, is developer initiated and has a different vision. Um, there are community planning after like Sunset Park has a 197A plan, which is a community-based plan. It doesn't have much teeth, right? But there is a vision there for what that could look like. Um, I know that like Uprose has developed the plan for the grid. There are ways that others can initiate proposals. The challenge here is that most of Industry City is the land that we're talking about is privately owned. Um, and so it would be hard for the city to basically force industry city to change uses. We, there's usually a thing in zoning called like grandfathering, um, where basically if something's already built and then the zoning changes, it's not necessarily gonna be considered, like the things that already exist are not out of compliance. Um, it's only new things that would have to comply. So that's, those are some of the challenges, I think, for some of what you're talking about. But citywide, 
we could certainly think about, right? Like how do we think about our need for um, affordable manufacturing spaces? The industrial zoning has not substantially changed for, uh, since 1961. And there's no plan afoot to change that industrial zoning, which shows you kind of what the political priority has been, which is nil. Um, so I don't, I don't think the zoning categories are good enough in order to shape an industrial or even a small business area. Uh, zoning is, uh, I, I think as Sylvia was saying, is a very weak tool uh, for planning. And the kinds of serious planning that need to occur uh, don't fit into the narrow uh, zoning regulations. And the problem is, you know, when it goes through Euler, any change goes through Euler, uh, one, this is another point. Once it's certified as complete by the city planning department and starts the Euler process, the city will always have an excuse why they can't change something. Because they already said, this is the plan, and an environmental review has occurred, and we can't redo it all again, or the applicant doesn't want to redo it, so nothing to discuss. That's why once it's in Euler, forget about trying to introduce serious and important and subtle changes. Okay, I'd like to make it just a comment before I take another question. I think something, and maybe Lena and Zishan can touch on this a little bit. So what happens if we, we're, we're organizing, right? We're putting together, we're saying, asking our council member to say no and vote no. We're asking city council to vote. But what happens, um, I think some of the neighborhood sentiment is that we're not being heard. And then if we're not heard and then the zoning goes through, what do we do next? Definitely go through the whole process um, and push the envelope. And in Inwood, we, uh, we knew we weren't being heard, but we wanted to make a spectacle of what the things that we were asking for were. We occupied his office, the councilman's office. Uh, we did a block party and cornered him on the stage and, and told him, and asked him what it was, what changes he, because he was saying, oh, I'm not going to pass this rezoning until there's certain changes. So then tell us what the changes are. That's, we cornered him and he, and we told him, he says, look out and tell the, the tell the people that are in this block party, because these are, the, we put it, we used, we did the block party in one of the poorest blocks of Inwood. And you tell those people, you tell your people, you tell your constituents what those changes are. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't, and we pressed him and we pressed him. And he finally said he was give, giving up five city buildings and they're going to be 100% affordable, community affordable, and we're still waiting for that. So all the deals are already cut by the time the EULA process starts. And the EULA process is really just a technicality, a formality, um, but go through it anyway, because that's that. At least that's been the inward experience. We we pushed it to the limit, and we and we make we made them say what it is that they were gonna do, and then we had them. Then we had them. You know, them, that whack them all. We got we grabbed them, and we said, "You said this, and you said that, and so where is the?" And then we were able to say these are all broken promises. Not only that, we foiled a lot of the communications that the the um, the council member and EDC had with the developers. They developers got everything they wanted, almost everything they wanted, and the community got bupkis. Well, I think the, the you know the three speakers have uh, said most of it. Um, but I mean, I just want to um, you know emphasize that the um, you know if, if the city doesn't like your plan or the city doesn't doesn't want to hear you, of course they have all kinds of excuses, right? They can tell you every step of the way that nothing can be done. You know, they can even tell you at the beginning nothing can be done, right? And then when you come up with a plan, then they will say, oh, it take it take ten years or twenty years, thirty years, whatever. You know, they don't want to pass it, you know, because they represent a developer. They want to destroy our community. This is our community, right? So, so you know, in the end, of course, you know, 
we, you know, the first, of course, you know, we, we don't have any illusion of the, of the politicians. And then second, you know, like Linda said, you know, of course they will put up all this process, right? You know, the youth they want to use the process to drag you out. And then, you know, we're going to try to flip it around and say, you know, we use this process to organize the community, you know, and, uh, we, and make it bigger so the city cannot, you know, ignore us. Right? And then, you know, of course the city has to listen to the people, and if the people organize and give, you know, enough pressure, of course anything can, can, can change. Right? Just like, you know, in the, the Inwood example, you know, they pass it, you know, the Blasio even sign it, and now, you know, they have a lawsuit and win. Right? So don't let the politician, you know, tell you, you know, nothing can be done. Right? I mean, in, in, the, in the end, yes, it is a, a power struggle. You know, it's either the rich developer or the community. And one thing, this is a good moment to wage this battle. Um, the Real Estate Board of New York, which is the most powerful representative of the real estate industry, is moaning and groaning because of the struggles against gentrification and displacement and major new private luxury development that is destroying communities, displacing more people of color, more immigrants and uh, transforming the city into something that doesn't look terribly desirable with vacant storefronts, with uh, uh, vacant luxury towers. Uh, you know, after they argue that they need more building in order to provide housing for people, they're producing buildings that are half empty because they're being sold to investors who live all over the world and they don't live here. So this is a good time. <clears throat> And you're in a good, good uh, uh, position because uh, most of the city council is going to come up for re-election. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So they're watching the back. They're term limited. They're term limited. That's oh, yeah, right. Oh yeah, And uh, De Blasio is already looking for his next job. Oh yeah. So there's the they're testing the waters, and we got to make. We gotta make the waters actually much deeper, uh, so that they drown. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, seriously, that this is a good time now. So I encourage people to keep organizing and stick to your guns and say what you. And the 197A plan is an fit was officially approved, approved by the city planning uh, uh, department. And then they threw it away like they did all the other 197A plans. But you stick with that. It's a, there were a lot of good proposals in that about public access to the waterfront, about industrial preservation, about preserving the small businesses. And did they even read it, look at it, uh, and, and take anything serious? That's the problem. That's why nobody's doing 197A plans anymore, because the city dishonors the community plans and only listens to the plans of big developers. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, um, I would like to hear in detail how did the uh, English residents reacted when the mayor passed the rezoning, because it will be an inspiration for the Sunset Park community to know that it's not an deal, even if it's passed, things can be taken into a change. So would you give us details, please? When that rezoning was passed, I think for a period of two months, everybody was depressed, including myself, and we felt very defeated. But there was something about us that just could not stand there and accept it. And even some of the groups that we worked with said, forget it, it's a done deal, it already passed, what are you fighting about? It's over, give up. And we just couldn't do it. And we said, we don't care. Even if we lose again, we have to fight. Because, you know, we just have to fight. And we got together and we did, um, we got 15 
I think it was 15 petitioners, people that I, I, I called from, uh, two people from the community, uh, one that had lost her business after 30 years and three generations. And another one, another lady who had been locked out of her apartment illegally with her dog still in it, in a snowstorm with her two kids and had to walk 40 blocks to her mother's house. Uh, and these two people were like, yeah, we're gonna go on this petition. And even if nothing comes of it, you know, it's like, you know, it's like telling, you know, it, it's, you have to fight. You can't just sit there and say, okay, I surrender. We, I, I mean, you know, we totally obliterated Idanis Rodriguez's political image in his district. Nobody, hardly anybody voted for him. He got 6% of the vote for public advocate. And that was because we did, we put up, we did shenanigans. We, you know, that, that uh, Halloween, we, we put up a thing called uh, Idanokio. Right, with with this big nose, like a big liar. I mean, we just got really creative. Um, you know, like we we just we just you, you, when you fight, you win. When you when if you don't fight, you definitely lose. Hi, my name is Chancellor. Uh, we had a whole bunch of meetings with Carlos Machaca, and he still not be down. We told him not to always do me, but he's still confusing yes or no. So I want to know what you could do about it. Because people are getting tired of this. We, we go to meeting, meeting, and he doesn't answer. Who is his, whose side he's on? He not responds to me. So nobody. I'd also like to preface that question. Um, so something that I've noticed just as a Sunset Park resident, um, invested in living here long term. Um, what have people in the neighborhood seen in terms of organizing and what have you feel like has been lacking in our neighborhood? Like how, what do you, some of you guys propose, this is a question for everyone in the audience, what do you propose are some tangible next things we can do to organize? I mean, we've heard some examples of what, um, you know, residents of Inwood and the Lower East Side Chinatown have done. What have you seen that's been done and that isn't working and what do you think we can do next? Talk to him as one. Talk to him meaning Carlos Machaca? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we've definitely been doing that, right? But besides like that, what what else what else do um, people think we can tangibly do next? Like what's a tangible next step after this marching. go marching? Okay. We've done that already. Yeah, we've done it. Yeah. Okay, so I guess what I'm trying to get people encourage you all to speak is um we can't keep having these very like in the air conversations about organizing when we can't um, think about plans. So for me, when I heard FOIL, I mean, I do FOIL requests all the time in my job. But that's something that we can do like in five minutes. So we just need to get like one or two organizers in the neighborhood that are willing to write up that FOIL letter to um, FOIL our council member and FOIL the EDC and the, the Economic Development Corporation to figure out what conversations are happening in the back doors that we're not um, knowing, right? Maybe that's the first step to see what has been promised and to them and what allegedly they were going to promise to us and let's see if that's really going to fall through in the plan. Um, anyone? Yeah? Really dig into um, into investigating um, land use laws and, and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that some of you have been around a long time. We were able to stop the Willits Point project in, in Queens. We pushed back against it and Tony Avello, the senator then, filed a lawsuit uh, because the land actually was still technically uh, parkland. And so it's a state law that you cannot build on park, you can't build on parkland. When the city had already passed it and already said it was okay because it had been paved over. Mm -hmm. So many times there are little things in the laws that you can find if you have enough staff to be able to research. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, we definitely, do any of you want to offer some input on how we can begin doing that research to figure out, you know, what are the zoning laws and what do they allow for and is there anything that's being done now in Industry City that isn't 
Should it be? And things that they're not telling you. I don't know if they're um, if they're trying to take public uh, land, but that's something like they tried to take the the in, the Inwood Public Library, uh, and it the libraries are supposed to have its own Euler process. So what they were doing was just throwing it into the pot, and like the parkland, mm -hmm. right? So when you find out things like that, you push and you and you bring that out. Bring the media into it. Get for, become friendly with the media because they will put that on the news. People will learn about it. You want as many people to know about this. Uh, form a tenant association in your building if you don't already have one. Tell all your neighbors. Flyer them. You know, explain to them. You know the import. What's what's going down the what's coming down the pike, um, and and ask them to get involved. I mean, do you guys have regular meetings? Is there a group that like a sunset group? That, yeah, we do. Okay, that's the that's the the place where you want to grow your membership. Just just a little detail. I, I read in some of your material. That part of the proposal is demapping uh, 40, 40, 40th, 40th Street. Okay, well, that is an appropriation of public land. That, you know, that's something to do some deep research on. And maybe FOIL. Who wants it to be mapped? Who's going to benefit from it? And how did that get in the proposal? Uh, you know, Economic Development Corporation. First of all, the key word in its title is corporation. I, I know there's um, some people who have burning questions, and I think um, we are going to get kicked out of this space very soon, but we probably have time for one more. So if you have like a very burning question that has not already been asked, yes. Uh, the difference between renters and private homes. So. I'm on 59th Street, that's my parish. And we have renters and we have private homes. Are the private homes, are they going to, they're probably going to increase in value, but is it going to be detrimental to them too? Because I can see a division between renters and private homes. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's about um, the difference between property values and uh, private homes and renters. Yeah, I mean, this is this goes back to the deeper question of land ownership, right? Like, what we're really talking about with all these is decisions over who controls the land. And a big reason that zoning is an adequate tool is because the question is, like, where is the community-owned land, right? And we, it's exciting that we have a growing movement around community land trusts. Um, there's a group of workers who are trying to organize a housing co-op here in Sunset Park. Like, there are a lot of ways to get to that question. Um, and that's part of the reason for the divide often that we see between um, between homeowners and tenants is because, and it's one reason that for instance, like in the East Village or any neighborhood where we've seen a down zoning or a contextual zoning, it has a different effect on people who are homeowners, right? Because if there's a strong market for single family homes, um, it can raise those, those property values. Um, but again, and, and so that's often why the city will be willing to do down zonings in those neighborhoods. And for renters, a down zoning isn't necessarily going to be a protection, right? Because it will still add to the squeeze on the supply, um, the competition for the housing market. And if we don't have strong rental protections, which now they're stronger, but if we don't have strong enforcement, right, people will continue to be at risk or the owners of those properties may want to sell them, um, which we were talking about, right? So there's a lot of dynamics. Um, but within, so there are often times where we'll see homeowners play a different role when we're talking about rezonings because they could benefit from increased property values. But we also know not all homeowners are the same, right? There are a lot of low-income homeowners um, who can really be burdened by, I don't know if this is the point you're making, but like increased uh, property taxes. Um, there are homeowners who may be really tempted to take a cash buyout. I think cash buyouts are a huge issue in Sunset Park. Um, so there are a lot of ways, I think, to build solidarity between tenants and homeowners and think about kind of the long term, because for especially someone who doesn't have generational wealth, um, if they sell that 
that home, that's kind of like a one-time cash out and no long-term plan. Um, I don't know if that's totally what you were getting at with that. Yeah. Um, and maybe you want to make this up. Yeah, um, there's two, there are two things come to mind right away. Um, the we're not taught uh, when we when, when we we're not against small homeowners, people that have one or two homes for you know their own use one and for, for property values. We are uh, we're we're not, we're not liking uh, the landowners that have two and three hundred buildings, multi-family buildings in their portfolio. Um, and when the value of a property goes up for a small homeowner, the value of the taxes go up and they have to pay more taxes and that could be burdensome to them. But another thing that happens is the property of the multifamily uh, building goes up and so the commercial spaces for the mixed use buildings, they, the, the stores then get that pass along the taxes are passed along to the commercial tenants and we see a lot of uh, uh, stores that are our favorite stores closing up because they can't afford that increase. Uh, I want to add, add on a little bit uh, because uh, in Chinatown, Long East Side, we probably have a little bit different situation because um, um, you know most buildings are, are about the units, right? So, but then you know we do have uh, uh, small uh, proprietors are actually part of the Chinatown Working Group when you know when we were formulating the the, the plan. And as uh, Lena highlighted earlier, you know this you know this kind of uh, very very contradictory you know kind of thinking you know in the in a uh, uh, small proprietor. You know, on one hand, they want to see all oh, the, the the value increase, but then on the other hand, they have to, you know, pay 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 more tax, you know, for it. And uh, so, you know, in, in in our example, you know, the the the, the, the renters and the small proprietors, they they uh, see the common interest, right? They don't want to pay pay more, you know, because the community are, are getting more and more unaffordable. So that's why, you know, the again, you know, we we use the the, the zoning to to uh, unify them because uh, let them see the common interest, you know, to give the protection to the community. So that way, you know, you know, we we able to bring them together, but also they also identify, you know, you know, now the 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 the, the mayor is the is the is the, the problem, because they because because he's against the renters and he's against the, the, the small proprietors, you know. So you know, I, I, I can't speak for Sunset Park because you know it's probably a different situation, but you know maybe you know through the organizing, I think people kind of see more common interests. So you know, like like who is the who is the common target we, 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 should, we, should, we should fight against, right? Rather than fighting among, among ourselves. So I wanted to take this moment to wrap up, but I can see that there's one last burning question in the back. So I think this will be our last one and then we'll start closing. Yes. yes. My question is that, um, you know, I'm a person, I'm a lifelong resident of Sunset Park, mm -hmm. and for many years I lived as a gypsy, moving from place to place because I lived in low density housing, meaning that it wasn't, it wasn't stabilized, mm -hmm. and I kept having to move because every time the building got sold, I had to leave. Now, I live in a rent stabilized place where, so my question is, um, in Inwood and in Chinatown, like how, because you brought up the privatization of public housing, and we don't have any public housing in Sunset Park. So my question is, um, private how, um, public housing is, is stabilized. How do these people then become displaced? Like, I have a lease where I live, and I, you know, I'm saying to myself, like, I'm not understanding clearly, like, am I going to be displaced even if I'm a stabilized tenant? So um, my question yeah, is, that's regarding a very good one. Yeah. Um, as rent stabilization is only as stable uh, as, as the tenant movement is powerful. So it had been eaten away at uh, for decades until just last year in Albany, there was a flip in the legislature and we got stronger rent laws uh, back again. Um, but still, rent stabilization 
isn't the final answer. There still need to be many more improvements, but it was the result of people organizing and uh, uh, taking advantage of the change in Albany um, to get these uh, uh, strength and red laws passed. Uh, and there's a lot more to do. <laughs> I would just add that specifically before the um, the rent laws in June, some of the things that would lead to people in rent stabilized units being displaced were, so there have been a bunch of reforms to basically roll back rent regulations. So it was basically like when the rent got to a certain level, it would be destabilized, right? Or there are things called major capital improvements where landlords can do or say that they've done these big improvements and pass the, the cost on to the tenants. Um, the other thing is that there was a statute of limitations of four years, so you couldn't challenge an illegal overcrease, uh, illegal, uh, illegal overcharge like increase if more than four years had passed. And all of this, and this is what hasn't changed, all of this is on the tenant, right? There's no agency that's well-funded that's going around to see whether landlords are constantly illegally flipping units. The other big thing is that we now have right to counsel. So what that means is that if you go to housing court, you have a right to a lawyer similar to criminal court. And we've seen through the combination of both those things, the, um, the number of evictions dropping significantly. But that doesn't mean that there aren't still lots of challenges. And that's why there have been some lawsuits that failed where um, around rezonings where um, communities were saying that the city should in its environmental review, it should be when it's calculating potential displacement. Currently, it assumes that rent stabilized tenants won't be at risk of displacement when we've seen time and time again that that's not the case, right? Um, and so actually those challenges so far have not been successful, um, but there are a lot of ways that this plays into to the relationship between basically when there's an up zoning that says, okay, there's a really hot housing market, residential market here, let's let the buildings be even bigger, for instance. That's what we see a lot, right? When people say rezoning, that's usually what they're talking about. So if you own a four-story building with eight units of rent-stabilized tenants, you're gonna wanna sell that thing. And in the meantime, until you can, you're gonna try to kick people out. Or we've seen sales of like Stytown, where the business model and that like the loan that the bank underwrote was, was totally built around, okay, you have to kick X number of ten tenants out and increase the rent rules by this much, right? Um, and the last thing, I know we're short on time, but in a positive note. Um, so there's a movement, um, there's like a homes guarantee platform nationally, there's a group, many of the groups that were involved in the rent successes the, the last round um, that are pushing for some of the reforms that they didn't win the last time and more. And one of those is just cause eviction, which would basically um, add some of the protections that rent stabilized tenants have to all units, right, whether you are in a rent-stabilized unit or not. So there are lots of ways to get involved with some of these movements. I mentioned community land trust as another growing movement. Like there's, and obviously labor protections is a huge thing because your housing is only affordable as how much money you make. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can get involved with um, through and beyond, I think, this particular rezoning fight. I think there's a process by which a person uh, can get evicted uh, and lose their rent stabilized housing you know um, that is uh, you know it the, the the devil is in the details um, make sure you don't have a preferential rent lease <laughs> um, that's you know those are uh, well now now it's not doesn't even matter because the preferential rent leases stay at whatever the, the price is but uh, before it was like people were being evicted, and the other thing is that um, the la uh, landowners were buying people out. They were paying people ten thousand, twenty thousand, and then like three months later, the person would be broke and homeless. Um, so they buy the ground underneath your feet, and then they push you out. And then they take that building and they down it, eliminate the rent regulated apartments, and put up a building that nobody can afford. You know? That's what, to me, but that's what rezoning is about. Uh, so, to um, simply answer your question, uh, the city puts uh, profit over people, right? 
So as long as uh, that's the case, as long as the city encourages uh, luxury development and speculation in the neighborhood, the landlord will always want to, uh, you know, evict, evict you, right? Evict a majority of the, the, the families because they want to make more money, you know, by, by, by building high and building luxury units. Uh, you know, whether you have rent stabilization or not, right? They will try to find different ways, of course, you know, different tactics, right? If you have some kind of protection, then they will try to find, find some loopholes, they will try to harass you or whatever. So it's a different tactic. And if you live in Niger, yeah, they want to privatize it. And uh, by, you know, doing the, you know, raising the, 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 the price uh, of the surrounding area, you know, people find it harder and harder to, you know, more and more difficult to, to live in the neighborhood. So in the end, you know, they are forced to live, uh, leave, and also, you know, they're facing harassment from the city as well, because, all because, you know, the city represents the interests of rich developers. And that's why, you know, they encourage all these things to happen. And the solution, of course, is, you know, for the people to come together, right, to say, you know, what we want, you know, we want the protection of the community. And, uh, and, and that way, you know, it's, uh, you know, the people enforcing the, the, the law, it's the people who, you know, um, you know enforcing these protections. How do you know who your uh, uh, your, poli your local politician is working for? Look at uh, Open Secrets and see who donated to this uh, campaign. Thank you. Um, and with that note, I just really want to thank everyone who came out here tonight, especially you know um, Tom, Sylvia, Lena, Zijan for offering some. Um, Tech, uh, very like tactical tools on what we can do next here. Uh, I encourage everyone to think about how you want to see your neighborhood in the next few years and what you think you can do now. Um, I am not, I never imagined myself to be up here to be an organizer, but I am the daughter of um, Mexican immigrants who was born and raised in a rent stabilized apartment, and because um, we live in a rent stabilized apartment. My parents sitting right here um, in the second row have been able to afford to send three um, young women to public schools and to receive a four year degree. So I think a lot about if we didn't live in that rent stabilized housing, they would never have been able to put us through school. Um, and we would have definitely been working some minimum or even below minimum illegal paying jobs. And so I think, um, so many of the people here, like we shouldn't just think about ourselves, but really think about those children you see in the morning going to school, to our public schools here. We have several, several elementary primary schools here. Think about what future we're going to leave for them. Um, you know, at least if you know the if if we're if the waterfront's going to go down in 40 to 50 years, at least right now while we're still here, while we're still present, while this city is still a sanctuary city, um, let's create those protection tools. I encourage everyone here, if you have any questions that are burning or you were too shy to ask, please contact Protect Sunset, um, the Sunset Park Organized Neighbors. We have our contact information up here. Um, I encourage you to look at the back and there's some flyers about this event. There's also just our general spawn flyer. Um, stay involved, even if it means phone banking with us an hour a week, an hour a month. I mean, we could use the help. Um, you should also definitely check out the Citywide Alliance Against Displacement. It's this um, Citywide Alliance Against uh, Neighborhood Displacement. I won't read through the details, but we'll have some copies of uh, this um, form that you can fill out so that we can collect some signatures. Um, other ways to get involved is we're thinking of planning this event for Spanish speakers and Chinese speakers. So if you're at all interested um, in helping us with that, please come through, let us know. We know this event was in English, but we really hope to unite um, all the entire population of Sunset Park, and we know language barrier is significant here. I hope you can spread um, some outreach materials and spread the word about who Spawn is and, and who um, Protect Sunset Park is. Really hope this isn't the last time I see you, and thank you so much for coming out. You are now free to go, as I say, and stretch your legs. I know it's a long evening, and thank you so much for making it here tonight. <laughs>